Hi and welcome! I'm Mary Logue and I am the branch manager at the Claremont Branch Library. And one of the things I have always loved doing is reading. Uh, but even more than reading to myself, I have loved reading out loud or being read aloud to. When I was a child, my mother introduced me to the Wizard of Oz books. Yes, books. There is more than one. There are actually 40 of them. And my mother would read to me from The Hungry Tiger of Oz, which was written by Ruth Plumley Thompson and is the 20th book in the series of Oz books. Those are very precious memories to me, and the experience gave me a love for the Oz books, a love of reading, and a love of listening to people read stories. So thanks, Mom, for the wonderful memories and for instilling such a love of the written and spoken word. So to share that joy and wonderment that hearing a story creates and that the Oz books gave to me, each weekday at 2 p.m. I'm going to read two chapters from The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. The book was written in 1900, and as Baum states in the introduction of the book, he wrote it to be a modernized fairy tale in which the wonderment and joy are retained and the heartaches and nightmares are left out. For me, it's a wonderful tale of a young girl who finds herself in a magical land and makes friends along the way as she searches for her home. Today, most people are more familiar with the movie The Wizard of Oz, which came out in 1939 and starred Judy Garland. But there were a number of changes that the movie made from the book. So as you listen to me read, look for those differences and perhaps some surprises. You may also want to think about how the book handles the themes of friendship and what home really means. Or maybe you just want to sit back, get comfy, and enjoy listening to a good story. So let's start. As I said, I'm going to be reading the first two chapters from The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So chapter one. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a floor and a roof, which made one room, and this room contained a rusty-looking cooking stove, a cupboard for dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all and no cellar, except a small hole dug in the ground, called a cyclone cellar, where the family could go in case one of those great whirlwinds arose, mighty enough to crush any building in its path. It was reached by a tra trap door in the middle of the floor, from which the ladder led down into a small dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the plowed land into a gray mass with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away, and now the house was as dull and gray as everything else. When Aunt Em came to live there, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and the wind changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was thin and gaunt, and never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also, from his long beard to his rough boots, 
and he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her surroundings. Toto was not gray. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long, and Dorothy played with him, and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the doorway with Toto in her arms, and looked at the sky, too. Aunt Em was washing dishes. Far from the north they heard a low wail on the wind, and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grasses bowed in the waves before the coming storm. There now came a sharp whistling in the air from the south, and as they turned their eyes that way, they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em, he called to his wife. I'll go check after the, lot, the stock. Then he ran towards the sheds where the cows and the horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed, and the girl started to get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. A strange thing then happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood and made it the exact center of the cyclone. In the middle of the cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher until it was at the very top of the cyclone. And there it remained and was carried miles and miles away, as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark and the wind howled terribly around her, but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, and one other time when the house tipped badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently like a baby in a cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran about the room, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once, Toto got too near the top of, open of the trap door and fell in. At first, the little girl thought she had lost him. But soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again, afterward closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright. But she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. At first, she had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed and lay down upon it, and Toto followed and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. Chapter 2 She was awakened by a shock so sudden and severe that if Dorothy had not been lying on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath and wonder at what had happened, and Toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark the bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed, and with Toto at her heels, ran and opened the door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked about her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sights she saw. 
The cyclone had set the house down very gently, for a cyclone, in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. There were lovely patches of greensward all about, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along between green banks, and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray prairies. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, she noticed coming toward her a group of the queerest people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folk she had always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who was a well-grown child for her age, although they were, so far as looks go, many years older. Three were men and one a woman, and all were oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a point a foot above their heads, and with little bells around the brims that, twinkle, that tinkled sweetly as they moved. The hats of the men were blue, the little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in plates from her shoulders. Over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue, of the same shade as their hats, and wore well-polished boots with a deep roll of blue at the tops. The men, Dorothy thought, were about as old as Uncle Henry, for two of them had beards. But the little woman was doubtless older. Her face was covered with wrinkles, her hair was nearly white, and she walked rather stiffly. When these people drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves, as if afraid to come farther. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy, made a low bow, and said in a sweet voice, You are welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the Munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the Wicked Witch of the East and for setting our people free from bondage. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the east? Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by a cyclone many miles from home. She had never killed anything in all her life. But the little woman evidently expected her to answer. So Dorothy said with hesitation, You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did, anyway, replied the little old woman with a laugh. And that is the same thing. See, she continued pointing to the corner of the house. There are her two toes, sticking out from under the block of wood. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. There, indeed, just under the corner of the beam, the house rested on. Two feet were sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Dorothy, clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen on her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who was she? asked Dorothy. She was the Wicked Witch of the East, as I said, answered the little woman. She has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, making them slave for her day and night. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor. Who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. Well, they are the little people that live in this land of the east, where the wicked rich ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land of the north. When they saw the wicked witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sent a swift message to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious, cried Dorothy. Are you a real witch? Yes, indeed, answered the little woman, but I am a good witch, and the people love me. I am not as powerful as the wicked witch who ruled here, or I should have set the people free myself. But I thought all witches were wicked, said the girl, who was half frightened at facing a real witch. Oh, no, that is a great mistake. There were only four witches in all the land of Oz, and two of them, those who live in the north and the south, are good witches. I know this is true for I am one of them myself, and cannot be mistaken. Those who dwelt in the east and west were indeed wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one witch, 
one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the West. But, said Dorothy after a moment's thought, Aunt Em has told me that all the witches are dead, years and years ago. Who is Aunt Em? inquired the little woman. She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I came from. The witch of the north seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground. Then she looked up and said, I do not know where Kansas is, for I have never heard of that country mentioned before. But tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh, yes, replied Dorothy. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries, I believe there are no witches left, nor wizards, nor sorceresses, nor magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized, for we are cut off from the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards? asked Dorothy. Oz himself is the great wizard, answered the witch, sinking her voice to a whisper. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the city of emeralds. Dorothy was going to ask another question, but just then the munchkins who had been standing silently by gave a loud shout and pointed to the corner of the house where the wicked witch had been lying. What is it? asked the little old woman and looked and began to laugh. The feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the witch of the north, that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her, but the silver shoes are yours, and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. The witch of the east was proud of those silver shoes, said one of the munchkins, and there is some charm connected with them, but what it is we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again to the munchkins and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another, and then at Dorothy, and then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there is a great desert, and none could live to cross it. It is the same at the south, said another, for I have been there. The south is quadling country. I am told, said the third man, that is the same at the west, and that country where the Winkies live is ruled by the wicked witch of the west, who would make you her slave if you passed that way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she counted one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk letters, Let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and having read the words on it, asked, Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child, drying her tears. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country, and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He is a good wizard. Whether he is man or not, I cannot tell for I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl who had begun to look upon the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied, but I will give you my kiss and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched the girl, they left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the City of Emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. 
the three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey, after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straightway disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone, because he was afraid to even growl while she was nearby. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way, and was not surprised in the least. And that's the end of chapter two. So please join me again tomorrow for chapters three and four. And please comment in the comment section. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this so far. So have a good day and hope to see you tomorrow. Bye.